Mario, guys, just should we do like a moment of silence for him? All right, we just did. That's enough. I got to get going, Ron. Uh, Dario, he's had a rough week, man, and, and he was having a lot of stress apparently going on, right, Dario? Just not. It works with me. Thank you, buddy. And, and it started to affect his marriage with Jolene, and man, nothing was going right for them, and, and there was this constant arguing and friction going on, and so he decided to consult this marriage counselor, right? And so after a while, he, he talked there with the marriage counselor, and he said to Dario, he says, hey, I suggest you run five miles a day for a week, and then give me a call back. So a week later, the counselor received a call from Dario, and, and he asked him, so how are things going with you and your wife? And Dario said, how should I know? I'm 35 miles away. <laughs> and he said, does, did Dario decide, well, hey, forget that counseling stuff. I'm just going to impress Jolene with my manly muscles, right? And get back to working now and going to the gym. Yeah, that'll work. And so Dario, he goes out, he gets this trainer at the gym, and he asks the trainer, he says, hey, man, I want to impress my wife real fast. I mean fast. What machine should I use? And the trainer looked at Dario and says, use the ATM machine outside. <laughs> So then Dar's like, well, forget that, man. That ain't working. And so he decided to get some new teeth, you know, get his teeth worked on and impress her with this new fancy smile. And so he goes to the dentist, and the, but the problem was his insurance there got denied and he only had a dollar on him, so they gave him buck teeth. <laughs> That's for you, Al. Thank you. And so he said, well, forget that, man. That ain't working. And so he decided to impress Jolene with his awesome spirituality. You know what I'm saying? I mean, after all, he's a deacon in training here at Sunrise, right? And so he goes to the latest Southern Baptist Association meeting that was being held here in town, apparently at this uh, conference room in this uh, local restaurant here. And, and during the meal, though, much to his dismay, the head waiter there, he discovered too late that they had accidentally served the other pastors and deacons there in Dario uh, with watermelon fruit punch that was actually spiked with vodka yeah and so the waiter he's wringing his hands nervously he's waiting for the backlash he's gonna get for this you know and he goes up to one of the table servers and he says quick man what they say and the table server said nothing they're all too busy slipping seeds into their pockets <laughs> vodka spiked water melon seeds all right let's just move on how many guys would say that Dario including that joke that was a rough week for him you know what I'm saying Rough time, one thing after another, just snowballed, just didn't work for him, okay? And, uh, but believe it or not, folks, once again, did you know the Bible says there is going to be a worse week coming than that one, believe it or not, to the whole planet one day. As we've been seeing, it's called the seven-year tribulation, the final week of Daniel's 70th prophecy. And you're going to wish maybe you had some of those seeds, apparently, okay? And we saw that this all begins, of course, after the rapture of the church, okay? And folks, the reason why it's going to be such a horrible time as we've been seeing is because Jesus said, he said, man, this is going to be the worst time in the history of mankind, never to be repeated again, and that unless God was merciful and shortened that time frame, the entire human race would be destroyed. But as we've been seeing, praise God, he's not just a God of wrath, which again, I have to say this every time, that's not a bad thing. What that really means is God is putting an end to the evil and suffering and injustice that's going on today. Anybody sick and tired of it? Well, God's not sitting up there doing nothing. He's called it a day, judgment day. He's going to put an end to it. But praise God, he's also a God of love as well. Okay, and because he loves you and I, he's given us so many warning signs in the scripture to let us know when it's getting close. So you're not caught off guard. So you're not left behind. So you don't miss out on the blessing of becoming a Christian before it's too late. Accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So in order to keep you and I here at Sunrise from experiencing that ultimate bad day of being left behind, we're going to continue our study called, that's right, the final Countdown. Now, John, you just want to give us the relay? No. no? Okay, at least he's honest. Praise God. Give it up for John. Uh, the number 10 sign we've seen on the final countdown was the Jewish people. Number 9 was modern technology. Number 8, worldwide upheaval. Number 7, the rise of falsehood. Number 6, the rise of wickedness. Number 5, the rise of apostasy. Number 4, the rise of a one world religion. Number 3, the rise of a one world government. And we are getting there by cracky. Start 8, 15, 12. We'll get there. Last time we saw the second sign was the rise of a one world economy. Okay? And what we saw there is that God lovingly foretold you I in advance nearly 2,000 years ago that when you see all the world's economies coming together as one under one umbrella which is happening right now today before our very eyes and we saw that with the chronological proof the fear manipulation proof and hello the quotation proof we're not making this up folks they even admit it that's exactly what they're up to it's no conspiracy here they freely admit this is what they're up to and so the point for you and I is this hey like it lump it leave it or not it's an indicator that we're living in the last days and we need to get motivated, okay? And do what Jesus told us to do. But that's not all. Uh, the fourth proof we know we're really headed for a one world economy, just like the Bible warned about, folks, is what I call the union proof, okay? The union proof. And no, I'm not talking about the Teamsters. Believe it or not, I'm talking something way worse than that. 
Unless, of course, you're with the Teamsters. Just skip that thing, okay? Uh, I'm talking about the economic unions, okay, that the Bible said uh, would happen in the last days, okay? But again, don't take my word for it. Let's listen to God's. Open your Bibles to Revelation 17. Revelation 17 is going to be our first uh, text there. Revelation 17. And as you turn there, of course, the context is uh, Mystery Babylon, the harlot. The one world religious system that works and rides in cohorts with the Antichrist. And the political system kind of working together in tandem there. Revelation 17 verses 9 through 13. And uh, the first part dealing with the mystery Babylon. And Lord willing we'll get to another text ex uh, expounding on that in a little bit. But starting at verse uh, 9 there. Uh, we're going to start taking a look at the Antichrist kingdom. And we're going to take a look at another aspect of that kingdom the Bible talks about. And how it's organized. How it's split up. Okay, let's take a look at what the Bible said is going to happen during the seven year tribulation. Verse 9 says this, now this calls for a mind of wisdom. Can I translate that for you? I hope you had a granola bar this morning. Please put your thinking caps on. I hope you didn't eat chicken and you're not thinking straight. Pay attention, use your mind. Okay, here's what he says. This calls for a mind of wisdom. The seven heads, and this is funny because if I only knew what the Bible, these mysterious symbols, you just keep reading. Nine times out of ten, it, it, the Bible tells you what it means, okay? And that's what he's doing. These seven heads, you don't have to wonder, okay? There's seven hills on which the woman sits. Now, there's also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. The beast, Antichrist, who once was and now is not, is an eighth king. Now, he belongs to the seven and he's going to what? His destruction. Don't follow him. Now the ten horns. Oh, if I only knew what they were. Well, thanks for asking, Bill. Just keep reading. The ten horns you saw are ten what? Kings. And have not received a, a yet received a kingdom. But for one hour, for time period, will receive authority as kings along with the beast, the Antichrist. And listen, they have one purpose and they're going to what? They're going to give their power and authority to the beast. Okay? And folks, a few weeks back, we saw this text a little bit. And if you remember that, we see how this passage tells us how the Antichrist kingdom is going to be split up. Specifically, the numbers called out here into ten different parts ruled by ten different rulers or kings, right? It says it right there. Okay, and then the point is this. At one point, they surrender all their power, all their authority over to the Antichrist. And uh, that's why he says you need to use your mind of wisdom. That's just step one being split. Ultimately, they're going to give it over to the Antichrist. And at that point, he's got full control. Okay, but again, here's the point. It's a good thing that you and I see absolutely no signs whatsoever. That was about 2,000 years ago. But we see no signs whatsoever of the planet being split up, let alone specifically into 10 regions, right? Well, if you were here a few weeks back when we talked about this, let's recap. Uh, yes, we do. And what's absolutely mind-blowing, folks, is that they not only are calling for the planet to be split up into 10 different economic kingdoms for economic control, but they are wanting to split it up not just in 5, not in 19, not 122, but wonder of wonders, they want to split the planet up into 10 kingdoms. I kid you not. Let's recap that, recap that a little bit. This is a map that was generated by the Club of Rome. Uh, economic advisors, world advisors. This was back in the 70s, folks, when they even came up with this map. And if you take a look at that map there, uh, it's pretty obvious. Uh, for those of you who hooked on correct math, uh, how many kingdoms have they split the planet up? This is back in the 70s. Ten. Ten. Very interesting. Okay. And then we saw it's even, uh, even more apparent today. This is, again, the direct uh, shot, screenshot from their website. Still up there. Okay, you can check it out, the European Union Commission's website. And they just happen to split the planet up into, guess how many sections? If you scroll down a little bit there, you're going to see, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, 8, 9, 10, 10. Wow, even they, modern, this is 1970s thing, they're doing it today. And then we saw it was really absolutely mind-blowing was the United Nations Parliamentary Assembly's website, UNPA. It's still there, by the way. You can check this out, folks. Uh, if you zoom in on it, they made an incredible announcement just a few years ago. Here's what it says. Quote, a global research program facilitated and coordinated through a convening group of what? Ten persons based in ten world regions was established last year with core funding from the Ford Foundation. Isn't that mind-blowing? That's happening right now. The Bible predicted that, folks, nearly 2,000 years ago. Okay? And so, I don't know about you, but it looks to me like we are headed for a world that is split up into 10 different economic kingdoms. That's going to, apparently said right there, 10 persons. And it's going to be headed by 10 different rulers or kings. And where have I heard that before? Revelation 17, okay? And I'm telling you, folks, we have slowly, methodically been prepared for this. They don't just have it mapped out. 
They are planning for you and I to go along with this, okay? Now, it's a step-by-step -step process. It's kind of like a frog in a pot, right? You, the classic analogy, uh, how do you keep it from jumping out? I always say put a lid on the thing. Too bad, he's going to be stuck. Okay, but anyway, they say, you know, it start out with uh, uh, water that it gets used to, and then you heat it up slowly but surely, and next thing you know, it, it just stays in there. It gets acclimated to it until it literally boils to death. Let's just close in prayer for that exciting analogy. Right. How many of you guys, by the way, have eaten frogs? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, praise God, I ate them back in the day, and maybe that's what's wrong with me and you. Oh, that raised your hand. But, uh, <laughs> okay. but that's what they've done. They've warmed us up to it over the years, step-by-step -step process. You know, because if they came out, hey, right now we're going to split the world up into 10 economic kingdoms, and you have to give up your national sovereignty, we'd freak. But little by little, they're getting us warmed up to the idea. Okay, now they di had done this in our lifetime. All this has taken place, by the way. They did that, this first step, okay, was the birth of the European Union. Right? The birth of the European Union. And what is that? We watched that happen before our very eyes. That is a region of countries over in Europe who have come together economically and they even have produced their own currency, new currency called the Euro. Right? And that seemed to be the kickoff event if you're paying attention to what's going on in geopolitics, folks, it is because now we have the formation of the African Union. And that's a region of countries in Africa uh, that have come together economically with their own currency as well. And there's plans right now for a South American Union, an Asian Union, a Mediterranean Union, a Central Asian Union, a Pacific Union, and a North American Union between United States, Mexico, and Canada. And we'll get to that in great detail in a little bit. But here's the point. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of thinking when they're done with all this union talk, I'm going to make a prediction. I'm thinking they're going to end up with 10. 10. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Because God's word is true. And that's exactly what they're doing. And then if that wasn't scary enough, we not only see the world right now before our very eyes being split up into these 10 different economic unions that the Bible said would happen when you're in the last days, like at Lumbit, or leave it or not. But we even have the rebirth of the revived Roman Empire that the Bible talks about, uh, the prophet Daniel said would come in the last days. And it happened, listen, with the signing just a couple years ago of the Lisbon Treaty over in Europe. How many of you guys heard of that? Hardly anyone. And yet they did it and it's been producing the revived Roman Empire that Daniel talked about nearly 24, 2500 years ago. In fact, Hillary Clinton was part of this and she says it is truly a historic event. And yet most of us have never even heard of it. Let's take a look at that treaty. Mrs. Clinton, when she met with Catherine Ashton, said that this was unbelievable what had happened. It was historic. You know, most people in America never even heard what was going on in the European Union with the Lisbon Treaty being ratified on November the 3rd. And on the 19th of November, uh, these two elected leaders taking charge of the European Union. In fact, Mrs. Clinton made the statement that decades from now, we'll look back on this historic event, the treaty being ratified, the election of the leaders. Oh, absolutely. She called it a major milestone in the world's history, and I think it is. Um, I remember back when the treaty was finally ratified, we made the statement, watch in January, things are going to move quickly. And that's where the EU is going. It's pulling together as Europe, as a single unified country instead of 27 nation states. So uh, it is, a, I believe, a major milestone, and we're starting to see it open before our eyes. The nationalities of the individual countries are disappearing. The sovereignty, they're giving up sovereign rights over their citizens. So what you have is a move from 27 states uh, of the world that is sort of like a federation, although it's not a true federation, moving to a single country which now encompasses land area, almost all of the former Roman Empire. And if we add the neighborhood policy uh, relationships, if you will, between the EU and the Mediterranean states, we are starting to see a Roman Empire forming. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7 talks about ten horns on the awesome beast known as the Roman Empire. Those ten horns, according to Daniel chapter 7, verse 24, will be the revived Roman Empire who will come to power soon after the rapture of the church. The revived Roman Empire will play a key role in the geopolitical activities of this world. But the Bible says prophetically in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, in the days of these kings, in the days of the revival of the old Roman Empire, look up, Jesus Christ is about to come and set up 
his kingdom that will be for a thousand years and then into eternity future. I believe we're living in that time period. But before the revived Roman Empire can come back on the scene, the rapture of the church must take place. And I think that could happen at any time, even today. Hope you're ready to see Jesus Christ face-to-face at the rapture of the church. And I hope you're not here today and you're going to be one of those people left behind. Folks, that is how close we are today. For the first time in nearly 2,000 years, we are seeing in our lifetime this coming to pass. Right now, because of the signing of that treaty that hardly anybody's heard of, we have the rebirth of a revived Roman Empire, okay? And not only that, it's, everything's converging all at the same time very quickly. We also see how Europe is wanting to, right now, elect a president over this revived Roman Empire. And it's not just any president. Listen to their own words, what they want. Quote, a new super president that would be the overall leader of all of Europe with responsibility over Europe's economic matters, for all foreign policy, and any European military operation. In other words, we want a guy who is going to take absolute total control over this newly rebuilt, revived Roman Empire. That's what they want. They're not just doing it. That's what they want. Isn't that wild? That's happening right now. But that's still not all. You talk about being ripe for an antichrist figure to take charge of this revived Roman Empire. But listen, we even see the people over in Europe readily admitting, listen, we're so sick and tired of these economic matters. We're so sick and tired of all the junk that's going on. We, 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 we want any guy, send us any guy to take charge of this empire. And we don't even care if he's even the devil. We will follow him. Don't believe me? Listen to this quote. This is a chilling quote, folks, from one of the guys there. Uh, This is from Paul Henry Spack. He's the former Belgian prime minister and the president of the Assembly of the Council of Europe. Listen to what he said. You tell me if they're not right for the Antichrist. Here's what he said. He says, quote, we don't want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people. Listen to this. He says, and to lift us out of this economic morass in which we are sinking. Listen to this. He says, send us such a man and be he God or the devil. We will receive him. Wow. And we're wondering who won the NBA playoffs? (laughs) Folks, this is wild, man. This is happening all before our very eyes for the first time in 2,000 years. Uh, At least Hillary Clinton was right. This is truly an historic event in our lifetime. We are seeing the birth of a revived Roman Empire. We are also seeing Europe is wanting to elect a president over this revived empire. And they not only want that, they say, and we are going to accept anybody as long as he can guarantee us peace and safety. Peace and safety. Wow. we have heard that before? Paul says, when you hear the world cry out for that baloney, he says, bang, sudden destruction comes upon them as a woman pregnant in labor pains, giving birth to a child, okay? This is what's coming happening uh, across our planet. He is going to do it, and they're right for it, even if he's the devil in disguise, okay? It's a huge sign, folks, that we are living, whether we like to want to hear it or not, we're living in the last days, okay? And again, as always, it, that, that freaks me. It shouldn't freak you out. It should motivate you. I don't know about you, but I heard somebody in the audience say, hey, praise God, I'm going. Jesus is coming back. That's our attitude. This means Jesus Christ is coming back. He's coming to get us. Anybody tired of this place yet? Okay, well, before we leave, we got a job to do. He's got to use us to get the gospel out. Hello? Don't you care? And so it motivates us. It doesn't scare us. It motivates us. Let's get busy. We ain't got time for this goofball stuff. We ain't got time to tear each other down. We got to work together. We got to get busy getting the Great Commission out there doing what it takes. Amen? Okay? That's not all. The fifth proof we know we're headed for a worldwide economy is what I call the, unfortunately, the America proof. Okay? The America proof. Okay? You see, what most people do, unfortunately... Uh, in Bible prophecy circles, some of them, is they assume that you and I here in America, we should be in Bible prophecy because after all, we're one of the world's biggest leading superpowers, right? I mean, we've got to be in there, right? Well, not necessarily so. And I would say no, at least not in a positive sense anyway. And we'll get into that in a second. Okay, but unfortunately what people try to do is I would say squeeze America into some different texts in Bible prophecy. And if you do your homework, I'm sorry, uh, it doesn't talk about America at all. Let me give you a couple examples of that. The first passage they try to squeeze, let's say that, I like that. Squeeze, you're getting there. (sighs) Squeeze America into is Isaiah 18 and the tall, smooth-skinned people. That's why let's take a look at that text that people will often cite saying this is referring to the United States. Isaiah 18 verse 7 says, At that time, gifts will be brought to the Lord Almighty from a people, what? 
tall and smooth-skinned, from a people feared far and wide, an aggressive nation of uh, strange speech, uh, whose land is divided by what? Rivers. The gifts will be brought to Mount Zion, the place of the name of the Lord Almighty. Well, folks, there you have it. I think it's plain as day. Isaiah 18 is clearly talking about a tall and smooth people who are feared far and wide. They live in a nation that's divided by a river. And so it's got to be America, right? I mean, we are separated by the Mississippi River and, and we're powerful and we're filled with people who are tall. Except Pastor Billy. It was a dry year when they plucked him. Okay. Uh, but, but it's got to be speaking about us, right? No. I would say no. Sorry, wrong answer. I know that's what people want it to mean. I know what the, that's what they hope it to mean, but I'm sorry, I think when you look at the context, that's not at all what it means, okay? First of all, if you do your homework in the passage, the context, that's what you're supposed to look at to rightly interpret, uh, it's talking about the land of Cush, okay? And so when you do your homework, that is modern day Ethiopia and that general area there. And if you do uh, look at a map, the river therefore that's dividing that country is the river Nile. It's not America. I'm sorry. The second passage, they try to, let's do that. Squeeze America into is Ezekiel 38 and the village of Tarshish. Okay, let's take a look at that passage there. Uh, here's what they would say uh, Ezekiel 38, verse 13, talking about the context of the Gog and Magog war. Okay, as we've seen before earlier. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of who? Tarshish and all her villages, pay attention to that, will say to you, have you come to plunder? Have you gathered your hordes to loot, to carry off silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, and to seize much plunder? <gasps> there you have it, Orson. It's the United States of America, right? Believe it or not, some people would actually use this and cite this text, and they would say, uh, the passage here about the, again, the Gog and Magog battle, they say, it's the United States of America. Because they say that Tarshish here is speaking of England. And the villages, therefore, must be talking about, not really villages, uh, it must be talking about colonies. And so, therefore, uh, the United States is, used to be one of England's colonies, so that's got to be us. Really? Uh, they would actually do that, folks. And uh, first of all, uh, uh, I don't buy into that. Uh, in, in, the, in Ezekiel's time, and that's again your homework you're supposed to do, understand what it meant to the people today and then rightly translate it for today. Uh, they considered Tarshish to be in the area of Spain. And so even if you wanted to go on that mentality, which I don't necessarily agree with, that villages mean colonies, okay, but even if you were to go down that route, okay, uh, that would make therefore then the, vil the colonies uh, to be Central and South America, not the United States. Okay, that's even if you want to go that route. But that's not all. The third pass is they try to squeeze America into, thank you for your audience participation, uh, is Revelation 12 and the Great Eagle. Maybe you heard of this one. This one's a little bit more popular. Uh, let's take a look at that text there. Uh, Revelation uh, chapter 12 says this. Revelation 12 verse 13 through 14. Now when the dragon, Satan, as defined by the context, saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman, Israel, Okay, who had been given birth to the male child. Speaking about Jesus, okay, clearly Israel. Now it says the woman, or Israel, was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times and a half a time out of the serpent's reach. Or in other words, uh, half of the seven year uh, tribulation. But folks, there you have it in Revelation 12, the great eagle. It's got to be the United States of America because we all know, folks, one of our prominent national symbols is the eagle. And so it's got to be us who rescues Israel. How many of you guys learn that sarcasm usually means no? Okay, you're catching on after 9,000 years, but uh, who's counting? Uh, no, okay, it doesn't at all, okay? Uh, first of all, once again, you've got to do your homework. Where does that phrase elsewhere in the Bible, great eagle uh, with Israel, appear? Well, go back to even as far back, as early back, as Exodus 19, okay? And it clearly says God carried Israel on eagle's wings during the Exodus, which means, therefore, that if God, and he did, rescued Israel from their first exodus, then guess who's going to do it in the second exodus from the Antichrist? God. I'm sorry. It's not the United States of America. The fourth one, the last one I'll get today, and we've got to move on. Because uh, I want to explain, well, why isn't America in Bible prophecy? At least not in a positive sense. Uh, the fourth passage they try to squeeze America into is Revelation 17 and the great prostitute. Okay, Mystery Babylon, the harlot. Let's take a look at that. Um, this is just one of the passages. Revelation 17, verses 1 through 2. Uh, and this is in before our opening text, you know, starting with verse 9. This is the beginning. One of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and said to me, Come, and I'll show you the punishment of the what? 
great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her, the kings of the earth, okay, committed adultery. And the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. But there it is, Al, clear as day. As you can see, the great prostitute that's spoken here is clearly the United States of America. I mean, after all, we rule over many waters. And unfortunately, we do export rottenness, adulterous material over to the world. And so it's got to be us. Ain't wrong answer. Okay, no is the correct. Okay, yes, unfortunately, we do uh, export rotten, adulterous stuff around the world. Okay, but that's not what this passage is talking about. The context is talking about Babylon the Great, the mystery harlot, one world religious system. Okay, and, and, and with the, uh, that comes against Israel and is also working in conjunction with the political system of the Antichrist. And yes, we'll see this in a second. Unfortunately, maybe America is showing signs of turning her back on Israel. Okay, but uh, we are not the Antichrist kingdom that controls the entire world. And we just saw earlier, according to Daniel, that the Antichrist does not rise out of the United States, but out of the revived Roman Empire in Europe. Not us. Okay, so no, I don't think that that even is talking about the United States. And so again, the question is, well, do we even really appear in Bible prophecy at all? Okay, well, I would say maybe, but only in a negative sense, in judgment. Okay, and this is just one passage that God says when you do this, you're going to pay a price. Isaiah 34 declares that, quote, all the nations that come against Israel in the last days will be judged. And so if we fall anywhere in Bible prophecy, I'd say, unfortunately, it's this. Look out if this were to ever happen. If America, unfortunately, was ever to cease to be a friend to Israel and actually start to become an enemy of Israel, God says, I'm going to judge you for this behavior. But it's a good thing we see no signs of us. Folks, what in the world do you think is going on with the current administration? Thank you. Okay? We are seeing unprecedented, folks, in this current administration. They are turning their backs on Israel like never before, which means, according to the book of Isaiah, we are in a heap of trouble. Okay? But speaking of judgment, I not only see America heading towards this unfortunate destruction, like Isaiah 34 warns, okay, but I also see us, if you will, disappearing, even though we're right now a world economic superpower. I see us disappearing, if you will, from Bible prophecy through a process of not just judgment, but through a process of integration. Okay? And, and that goes back to our opening text. In other words, I believe that we are going to be swallowed up. We're going to be integrated into one of these ten economic kingdoms that the planet is being swallowed up. Okay? And I've got some proof. The first proof we know that the United States of America is going to be swallowed up into an economic union. Okay, and they're proposing one called the North American Union. Okay, and that is the currency proof. Okay, the currency proof. Folks, believe it or not, right now there has been plans and talks, not just talks, but plans. Okay, for several years now, many years now. Okay, for believe it or not, the United States to merge into what's called the North American Union. And this proposed union would be made up of the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And their proposed new currency, and don't get sidetracked, whether it ends up being called that or not, don't get sidetracked. But in the original stages, the new proposed currency would be called the Amero. Like the European Union has the Euro we would have a new currency called the Amero. And believe it or not, folks, it was actually leaked out on a financial broadcast of all places where they said, you better watch out for this new currency coming called the Amero. Watch this. This is wild. Uh, Steve, we also just heard uh, from Paul Chuck that he does expect the dollar to continue to weaken into Christmas from uh, against the euro. Uh, do, you, do you think that momentum will impact any other asset classes? Well, I'll tell you, take a look at the precious metals then taken off to the upside on the back of this this dollar drop, uh, we're coming into a cyclical bottom for gold and it rises going into December, January, so that might be the reverse of the dollar fall. Um, apart from that, I think one thing people who are dollar-based need to focus on is the Amero. That's the one thing that nobody's talking about that I think is going to have a big impact on, uh, on everybody's life in Canada, the U.S. and uh, Mexico. If you Google it, you'll find out all about it. Well, you could tell us a little bit more right now. You always hear it on CNBC. Don't you? <laughs> the Amero is the proposed new currency for the North American community, which is being uh, developed right now between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico to make a borderless community, much like the EU, and uh, the dollar, Canadian dollar, U.S. dollar, and the Mexican peso replaced by the Amero. You, um, you really think that will get any, any leeway? Uh, you may want to visit a couple of websites and see how far along it is. The Canadians are pretty upset about it, whereas the Americans, apart from the Texans, um, are the only people who know anything about it. The, the rest of the public's really uh, 
sort of with their head in the sand on this one. Interesting. Yeah, go Texas. They got another battle. We'll get to that in a second. That they're actually trying to fight. Okay. But uh, you mean to tell me the United States, Canada, and Mexico is going to have this new proposed currency called the Amero, and, and we're going to be pushed into some sort of an economic union, a combining of these countries, just like the Bible said would happen, what? Even to us? 2,000 years. years ago? Okay. But hey, come on. I mean, that's just some wacky conspiracy stuff. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm not saying thus saith the Lord or anything, but you start to look at this and you start to wonder because everything's slowly, methodically planned behind the scenes. Here in America, if you recall, uh, growing up in school, typically there was two main secondary languages that we always seem to get to pick from. And it's usually one of two. The first one is French, as in French-Canadian. The second one is always Spanish, Mexico, and maybe they're been working on this longer than what we thought. But that's all the second proof. Speaking of the Texans, listen to this. That we know we're headed for an economic union, United States of America, in the last days, is what I call the highway proof. Okay? Now, for those of you who have ever seen that video before, when that first came out there on that news broadcast, financial news broadcast, of all things, people began to scoff about it. Okay? Big time. Downplay big time. And, and they just really railed on this guy and says, oh, that guy, he just made an unfortunate mistake. He got snuggered into reading some of this baloney that's on the internet. You can't trust it. Yeah, unfortunately, it was on live TV. Okay, but you can't trust any of that stuff. It's just wacky conspiracy stuff. Well, it's one thing, folks, to downplay that news broadcast that leaked out the currency, the combined currency called the Amero. But what do you do about the other news broadcast that talks about a new highway system they're building right now that's connecting all three countries without Congressional approval. Let's take a look at that. Texas is putting up a fight for it. Let's take a look at that. Well, open borders advocates are refusing to acknowledge rising evidence of plans for a NAFTA superhighway. Many in the mainstream media uh, absolutely refuse to acknowledge the reality. The plans could be a major step toward that North American Union of the United States, Canada, and Mexico. President Bush says opponents of a NAFTA superhighway, in his view, are laying out a conspiracy. Senator Obama says he sees no evidence of a North American Union. Even some news organizations are criticizing me for raising the issue. Time Magazine journalist Joe Klein accused me of, quote, spewing false inflammatory nonsense. So we asked Bill Tucker to, to report on the issue. He found there's plenty of evidence of plans for new transportation links between Mexico and Canada. And only, uh, in my opinion, a fool would refuse to see those links. There is no NAFTA superhighway, not officially. Some even call it the invention of the far right wing. But some politicians find the denials almost laughable. The uh, folks in Washington are in denial about the, uh, the super NAFTA highway or whatever you want to call it. It's the concept that there will be uh, a highway, free trade, from Mexico through the central part of the United States all the way to Canada. In Texas, planning and development is underway for what are officially called transportation corridors. The Trans-Texas Corridor, I-69, a combination of rail lines, utility lines, car and truck lanes, planned to be as wide as three football fields laid end to end. It will be financed by a private foreign company, most likely Spain's Centra, who will then own the lease on the road and the revenue generated by the tolls. Texas may use eminent domain to lay claim to some of the land needed to build it. For an imaginary road, there is a lot of money and effort involved and some very real opposition. We don't want this corridor! But as we all know, no offense to the people in Texas, we know that uh, they got nothing better to do on a Saturday afternoon. And they're always marching around on something that's totally non-existent. Excuse me? Okay, so much for a wacky conspiracy theory. Now, did you notice that who's financing this thing? A company in Spain, Europe, and they're going to control the whole thing? I bet you the Antichrist would love to have control of that. Interesting, you know, because he's going to control all the economic... You see it how it's all putting together? Not by chance, folks. Okay, I'll use this word later, but you know what this is? It's called treason. We'll get to that in a second. The third proof we know America's headed for an economic union in the last days is a political proof. Okay? Folks, believe it or not, I know this might be a tough cookie to swallow what I'm sharing with you this morning, but we have to deal with the facts, okay? Uh, we're paying a price for putting our heads in the sand. This is treason in our country right now, and it is treason in high praise places, okay? And for those of you who still want to scoff at this Amero talk, and again, whether it ends up being called the Amero, whatever, it's still out there, the proposed currency. And if you still want to scoff and say, well, those Texans are just marching against something non-existent, and Spain's spending a whole lot of cash on something that doesn't exist, Okay? All you got to do, folks, is look no further than the political proof. 
Okay? If these people were not serious about doing this, then why in the world do we have all the presidents from all three countries constantly, consistently meeting, talking about this, making plans on this for the many years? And folks, this has been going on back even since the Bush administration, okay? New concerns tonight about moves towards what some call a North American Union. A number of high-level government meetings are taking place in Mexico to discuss North American integration of Mexico, the United States, and Canada. More meetings are scheduled. It is an aggressive agenda proposed at the highest levels of our government and U.S. commerce without congressional or voter oversight. Lisa Sylvester reports. A caravan of cars travels along the Arizona desert. Homeland Security Secretary Michael Chertoff was visiting the U.S.-Mexican border. Last week he was in Mexico City. Commerce Secretary Carlos Gutierrez visited Mexico February 1st. Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez January 11th. And President Bush himself will travel there next month. The high-level meetings are to advance North American integration, also known as the Security Prosperity Partnership. There are several ways it could go. One is modeled after the EU. One is modeled after sort of the, uh, an economic community. It's beyond the scope of, of just a trade, free trade zone, which we fairly well have already with those two countries. Anyway, well, that was the Bush administration. I mean, I mean, as you know, the media thought he was kind of loopy, you know, anyway. But uh, we got a new president now. And this president has promised you and I change. Can I say the obvious? I'm sorry. i got to say this. How's the change working for you? Okay. But I'm sure this is not the kind of change that he's talking about doing, combining all countries and with that. Really? Well, we'll get to that in a second. But you might think, well, Canada, Mexico, they ain't going to go along with it. I mean, they're, surely, maybe it's just, unfortunately, it's some weird administration. No, even Mexico uh, is doing it. Hey, has anybody heard of something called the border crisis? Maybe there's something more to this border crisis. Maybe it's all becoming a crisis so that we'll do something new, like combine our borders. Let's take a look at this. Mexico wants it too. Let's take a look. Now, four years ago, I bet I was a lot like you. Um, I started paying attention to the border crisis, and I thought to myself, why is this happening? I mean, it doesn't even make sense. I thought we thought about security. Well, since I couldn't apply logic and understand what was happening in the border, I started looking for alternative theories, and it took me down lanes I didn't want to go, quite honestly. I mean, who's watching the border? Who would benefit from things saying screwed up? I hate to break it to you, but after two years of denying it and saying this can't be, it's the only reason that I have found that explains everything that's going on in our country with a border. Our country has been sold out in the name of global profits and votes at the ballot box. This is where the Security and Prosperity Partnership of North America, or SPP, comes in. This little agreement, international agreement, cooked up by President Bush, the former president of Mexico, and the Prime Minister of Canada. Their mission is to blur or completely erase the borders between Canada, U.S., and Mexico to get goods and services freely flowing between all three countries in the dream of one big happy Mexamera Canada. And that would finally become a reality. Sound great? Not so much. On uh, Larry King Live, where everybody like you, like me, who have been saying, wait a minute, I don't want to believe this, but it looks like it's happening, we've all been called crazy. This is what Vicente Fox said on Larry King Live. Roll the tape. What uh, we propose together, President Bush and myself, it's ALCA, which is a trade uh, union for all of the Americas. Is it going to be like the euro dollar, you mean? Well, that would be long, long term. I think the process is to go first step into a trading uh, agreement. And then further on, a new vision like we're trying to do with NAFTA. He says in this interview, Jerome, He's asked, so it would be like the euro dollar? Well, long, long term. I was with one of, the, one of the country's leading economists having dinner the other night, and I said, what point do you start, and this guy's an optimist, at what point do you start worrying about the dollar? And he said, Glenn, about six months ago. He said, it's almost like we're intentionally destroying the dollar. But why in the world would we intentionally destroy the dollar? I'm telling you guys, if you don't understand Bible prophecy, none of this will make sense. But if you understand what the Bible said would happen in the last uh, 2,000 years ago about this ten horn kingdom, it makes perfect sense. Why would people deliberately destroy uh, our dollar? Well, maybe it's because, folks, uh, we're being prepared to receive a new currency combined with three uh, countries, okay? 
But maybe that's just Mexico. Maybe that's uh, just the United States and the former Bush administration. I'm sure Canada, right guys? Give it up for Canada. Hey, hey, hey. Right. I'm sure Canada's holding strong, aren't they? Well, unfortunately, believe it or not, uh, their former prime minister, Paul Martin, uh, he talks about national sovereignty. And what he shares is, you know what? If we're all going to come together and be able to keep our prosperity, we're, it's just something we're just going to have to give up. Here's the actual uh, interview. Take a look. Let me close just one, one, one more thing on this question of sovereignty. It's very difficult for a large country to accept that somebody is going to come in, like the United States or like the Europeans, and is basically going to come in and say, you're not doing your regulation in a proper way. Fair game. But what's going to happen when China and India are economies as powerful as the United States or Europe? And what's going to happen when there's a mortgage meltdown in India? What's going to happen when a Chinese hedge fund goes under? And that the results of that tsunami don't stop at the Chinese or the Indian border, but that in fact you find them in Idaho and Iowa and California. Who's going to deal with that unless we're prepared to understand that in fact we're all going to have to give up a little bit of our sovereignty in order to make the world work. Don't you guys understand? I mean, we, we've got all of our economies are all combined together, right? And, and do, don't you understand what happened to this last economic crash? It just, by the way, doesn't seem to keep going away. Uh, uh, that, you know, what's going to happen? We have got to work together. We have got to come together. I mean, listen, do you want this to happen again? Do you want it to get worse? Do you want to have worse hard times? What if it happens? Ah, we've got to be prepared, he says to give up our national sovereignty, come together, be, form a more powerful union to compete against these other guys. But again, maybe that's just the former Bush administration, and, 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 uh, but again, uh, Mexico and Canada, some of their former guys, but I mean, surely that came at a halt after he left office, right? And our new president, he's not going to do this. Unfortunately, folks, as one guy says, the old boss is looking a lot, uh, the new boss is looking like the old boss. Let's take a look at that. Well, another announcement today by President-elect Obama giving new life to the North American Union, a plan by business and political elites to tear down the trade barriers among the United States, Canada, and Mexico, and to create a NAFTA superhighway, all of which to be done without the approval of Congress or the American people. President-elect Obama named a die-hard free trader and a NAFTA supporter to be his U.S. trade representative. Bill Tucker has our report. Ron Kirk is President-elect Obama's pick to be his front man on trade. Kirk made his name in politics, serving as mayor of Dallas, where he was known as a staunch supporter of free trade agreements, NAFTA in particular. He was a big proponent of a trade corridor from Mexico up through Texas, a road he once referred to as a NAFTA freeway. His nomination was welcomed by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers. Advocates for a change in trade policy are not so happy. Now the apparent contradiction in Obama's words and actions has activists on another front worried. Last February, Obama pledged that he would resume the security and prosperity partnership talks between Mexico and Canada that, that President Bush initiated. He also said the talks will be transparent. Those opposed to the North American Union say that now whether he will or will not deliver on that promise becomes something they doubt. Blue. Well, this is, uh, you know, this is early on. Uh, the president-elect uh, is starting to look like, you know, a bit of, it's starting to look when it comes to trade. As Lori Wallach, the public citizen, pointed out, Global Trade Watch, uh, I mean, the old boss is starting to look a lot like the new boss. Can I translate that for you? Here's what's going on. In other words, it doesn't matter what president we have, what party gets elected, they're all in it together and they're all working and destroying our great country, the United States of America. And it's not just outright treasonous, but it's fulfilling Bible prophecy before our very eyes. It's allowing us folks to get swallowed up into one of these ten economic kingdoms the Bible predicted that would appear on the scene when you're living in the last days. No wonder we're not found in Bible prophecy other than in a negative sense, other than judgment. We are going to get, if they have their way, we're going to get integrated into an economic union. It's happening right now. What more does God got to do to get our attention? And if anything, I always had an instructor. He says, yeah, well, hey, this is all coming. He says, but me personally as a Christian, I'm going down swinging with the Bible in one hand uh, and swinging with the other. You, 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 retreat is not an option, folks. We have to speak up and make a difference. And again, this is the point. What does God got to do, Christian, to get our attention? 
This is not a game. This is real. And God does not want us as a non-Christian to go into the seven-year tribulation. He certainly doesn't want us to go into hell. And so this is why out of love, he's given us all these signs in advance of this one world economy, even the economic union stuff, to show us the tribulation is near. And this is why Jesus said, Luke 21, 28, when these things begin to take place, when you see the seemingly impossible, when you see Europe coming together in these economic unions, and when you see Europe wanting to elect a super president, even if he's the devil himself, when you see the revived Roman Empire coming into place, when you see the unbelievable America is being sold out under our feet to be combined into one of these ten economic kingdoms, you better stand up. You better lift up your heads, baby, because our redemption is drawing near Jesus. Christ is coming back. Okay? We need to get motivated as Christians. We need to get busy uh, not sitting on the sidelines. We need to get on the front lines like those Texans and do something. And not just share politics. We need to share Jesus Christ. Okay, and God can hopefully use us uh, to do that. But again, if you're here today in closing, if you're not a Christian, what more does God got to do to get your attention? Hello? What more does he have to do to get your attention? This is not a game, this is real. We are headed, what the Bible says, is called the Antichrist kingdom. And again, Jesus said it's going to be your absolute, utter, worst nightmare. He's going to come in offering this peace and prosperity, peace and safety. He's a false messiah. The world's going to be duped and then bang, sudden destruction. He is going to begin the process of annihilating this planet. Demons will be crawling across this planet. It's going to be the worst time in the history of mankind. Don't be left behind. If you're not saved, you need to get saved now. Call upon the name of Jesus Christ before it's too late. Amen? Let's pray. Well, hi. This is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church. And I hope you enjoyed today's study. But before you go, let me ask you one final question. Are you sure that if you were to die today, that you go to heaven and not hell? Before you answer that, let me share a couple things with you. Did you know that the Bible says that God is holy and that we are not? And the Bible also says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness is death. In other words, when we die, and it's coming for each one of us, we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, but it's going to happen. The Bible says, therefore, since the wages of our sin is death, we deserve to die and go straight to hell and not to heaven. And that's bad enough, but to make matters worse, we don't want to admit this. God already knows. He knows uh, all of our behavior, everything, our thoughts, what we've done, what even we're going to do. He knows it all. He's gone. Even though he already knows this, we don't want to admit this. And so out of love and mercy, God gave us something called his law or the Ten Commandments. It's kind of like his x-ray into our heart to show us what he already knows, that he is holy and that we are not. And it's this unholiness or sin that separates us from him. Let's take a look at God's x-ray, if you will, his divine law, to show us what he already knows. The Ten Commandments, uh, the ninth one, says this, you shall not bear false witness. Okay, that's called lying. Okay, and if you've ever told a lie once, which we all have, myself included, the Bible says that makes you a liar. Okay. The, the, another commandment says, you shall not steal, okay? Uh, and you might think, well, that's something that everybody does. Well, it doesn't make it right, and it demonstrates what God is trying to show us, that uh, we all have sin, and it's separating us from him. Even if you took a pencil in the third grade from somebody, if you did it without permission, that's stealing. And so now you've become a thief. The Bible says that you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. And how interesting it is and unfortunate that the only name under heaven by which men might be saved, the name Jesus Christ, has now become a common cuss word. The Bible says that God is so holy that even his name is holy. If you've taken the Lord's name in vain and used it as a cuss word or even flippantly, the Bible calls that the sin of blasphemy. And so now you become a blasphemer. The Bible says you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus says if you even look at another person with lust in your eye you've committed adultery in your heart and finally the bible says uh, you shall not murder and you might think well hey i haven't done that one really well again the bible says that the sin of hatred is the same as the sin of murder the only difference is you pulled the trigger if you will in your heart you wish they were dead and in god's eyes it's the same thing in principle Folks, that's only just a couple of the Ten Commandments. We didn't even go through all of them. 
But I think you're starting to get the picture. The Bible is correct. We have all fallen short of the glory of God, myself included, and that we are separated from God as a result. And so when our time comes, we're not automatically going to heaven. We are headed for judgment. We are headed for hell. Now let me tell you the good news. The good news is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to save us. Jesus Christ died on the cross. It was the death penalty of its day. He paid in full uh, the price for our sins to be forgiven. Let me give you an analogy. For instance, even today, we could see that a person could commit a crime. Uh, they, they cannot reverse it. The, the sentence has been passed. The judge has uh, slammed his gavel, and they are ushered off into their jail cell. And in this particular crime, they are going to receive the death penalty. And so they're behind bars just waiting for the time, waiting for the call for them to go and uh, receive the death penalty. But believe it or not, as we know, there is a way that a person can get off a death row. And that is if the one in authority, the governor, would grant them a pardon. Now, they didn't earn it. Uh, they certainly don't deserve it. And there's nothing they could do uh, to earn it because nothing can reverse their crime. Okay? Yet the one in authority has that ability to grant them a pardon. Well, can I tell you something? That's what God has done through Jesus Christ. The cross was the death penalty of the day. God sent his one and only son to die on the cross, to take the death penalty in our place, and that if we would just receive his pardon for all of our sins, God is willing to allow us to get off a of death row. He's willing to forgive us completely of all of our sins. That's the good news that I want to share with you. God loves you. The Bible says that God is not willing that anyone should perish, but everyone come to repentance. Won't you, if that's you, call upon the name of Jesus Christ right now? Won't you ask him to forgive you your sins? The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Won't you do that now, wherever you are? Please, take God up on his amazing, loving offer. I'll let you down. Man will let you down. People will let you down. But God never will. He wants to adopt you into his forever family. He loves you. He's willing to forgive you of anything and everything you've ever done, past, present, and future. It's amazing. Please, call upon Jesus now. Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church. If there's anything that we can do for you, please don't hesitate to ask. Our number and information will come up here on the screen here shortly. And remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.